Zena in with you at the Fight Rack, and today I'm reviewing Richard Wolland's Wind from the East, which details French intellectuals, the Cultural Revolution, and the legacy of the 1960s. This book de largely details French Maoism, and my review has actually already been typed and was published on the Cosima Project, which I urge you to check out as a project of communist reconception to engage with and to contribute to. Anyway, Maoism may seem out of fashion nowadays, considering China taking the capitalist road, yet within the last few years we've seen capitalism enter a tailspin, and we see Maoist movements remain an alternative in both India and Nepal. In that light, it seems only appropriate to look at revolutionary alternatives that once existed. And despite the fact that Wolin is a liberal, he does an admirable job of showing the strengths and weaknesses of French Maoism. The Maoists of France came out of the general upheaval of the 1960s that was spreading from Beijing to Chicago. Wolin locate, locates the Maoists as emerging and responding to the particular problems of French society. For instance, France in the 60s was undergoing massive changes. The student population more than doubled. The peasantry was shrinking, and the spirit of consumerism was expanding. It seemed that France was quickly entering a golden age. I don't know how consumerism is really that great, but I, some people, I guess. French universities were becoming overcrowded, marred by draconian regulations and staffed by elusive professors. Reminds me of certain places I've been. Furthermore, the expansion of consumerism brought to the fore that happiness could not be quantified. Page 55. Indeed, questions of everyday life, as Wolin points out, were to be one of the defining features of the May Revolt, and in my opinion, one of French Maoism's greatest contributions. However, in discussing the roots of the May Revolt in France that, lar that shaped Maoism there, Wolin makes a, hey, a quite a large omission. He neglects any large-scale analysis of the proletariat. Wolin goes as far to say, on page 47, that the French structural transformation of work and the attractions of the affluent society combine to render the traditional Marxist notion of class struggle antiquated. Guess what? That doesn't really hold up that much well at all. Because in May 1968, you suddenly have 10 million workers out on strike. And one thing that definitely made the May Revolt so distinctive in the 60s was it wasn't its student radicalism. It wasn't really its concern for changing of everyday life. You saw that whether in China or the United States. What made the French May so distinctive was that the student revolt or the student radicalism helped spark a general strike that nearly brought a socialist revolution to France. And the French Communist Party did not see the May Revolt as revolutionary. Or if they did, they were doing all they could to stop it. I would argue that it didn't matter either way. The French Communist Party was so wedded to the system, they weren't about to fight to change it. In this light, it kind of makes sense to say that the Marxist notion of class struggle is not quite so antiquated after all. International events also helped shape the view of French Maoists. There was the Vietnam War. And there was France's recent colonial experience in Vietnam and Algeria as well, which involved large numbers of troops and torture. In the case of Algeria, the French war had brought a military coup to France and near civil war in the country itself. Yet it was China that the Maoists drew their greatest inspiration, especially with the launch of the Cultural Revolution in 1966. Wolin says that for the Maoists and their sympathizers, what kind of was, and I quote, that the illusion of the radiant utopian future was preserved, 124. The Maoists saw the cultural revolution as proof that no blueprints existed, but sought to place their faith in the people's capacities to continually adapt their struggles to new situations, page 302. And, but, despite the inspiration from abroad, for Wolin, the primary focus of Maoism in France was France. This thesis seems to hold up well, but Wolin doesn't really explain what the Cultural Revolution was about to him. To him, it was largely, in a quote, a naked power struggle, and it's in parentheses, rife with persecution and abuse for anyone 
or anyone who is suspected of being insufficiently revolution. And we got Mao said to have that the that the revolution, the people were amateurs, that the party cadres were pretty much the trustworthy professionals. That doesn't really hold up to me, and I'm no Maoist. What made the Cultural Revolution was that many party notables who were especially un who were previously untouchable were criticized by the masses. Wolin may be focusing on France, but I would argue he should look a little more closely at the Cultural Revolution. In the Cultural Revolution, we could have seen what appealed to French Maoism. Yeah, he emphasizes the persecution, the abuses, and the economic stagnation. Blah, blah, blah. We've all heard it before. You pick up any bourgeois newspaper, you go into any bookstore, and you look in the China section, that's what you find. Yet there were plenty of innovative aspects of the Cultural Revolution. Factories were com completely reorganized in many cases, bringing greater worker involvement. The arts were transformed. There's the famous barefoot doctors. Education was revamped that allows for greater mass involvement. And you have ordinary people who were encouraged to experiment, to act, and to think. The meat of Wolin's book is taken up by the French Maoist movement between 1968 and 73. In the beginning, many Maoists were skeptical of the May Revolt. For instance, the... How, and, but... Although they may have been skeptical, the, front, the Maoists quickly uh, changed their tune and joined into the fray. And as the movement petered out, the Maoists sought to carry the revolution forward. And in the aftermath of the revolt, you have Maoist movements proliferating across France. There was the UCF ML, ML that was interested in providing revolutionary leadership. The UCF, for short, that I'll say now, worked with, the, with immigrants, dwellers of shanty towns, and workers in factories. Many of the most moving pages of Wolin's book deal with Maoist activists who investigate working conditions and go to work in the factories for the first time in their lives. And Wolin definitely shows the idealism that radiated from these activists. And then we have the, the Maoist group Gorche Proletariat. Sorry, I'm not, I don't speak correct. GP that I'm going to say from now on, that had to fight censorship of its paper, Le Cause de la People, which was it, which uh, ended up hiring Jean-Paul Sartre as its chief editor. And we got a long chapter on Sartre's involvement and later distancing from the GP. And we get definitely get a look at from Wolin of how Sartre was attracted to the GP and revised his role of intellectuals to emphasize that the intellectual should forsake his privileges and should later come to a greater form of mass action. And we definitely get a sense of Sartre's involvement with the Maoists extending to demonstrations and articles. We get the disillusionment of Sartre as well. The GP we also get was involved in mass mobilizations, particularly in a town in France where a woman was murdered by a town notable. And we get the GP that's involved in highlighting class and sexual oppression. And we get the GP that supports worker self-reliance and wildcat strikes. And the GP also worked with Michel Foucault, I believe, how you say that, to help, that helps free imprisoned comrades. And Foucault uh, used his time with the GP and his activism to help explore questions of power and prison. And this helped lead to his development of the work Discipline and Punishment, which dealt with prison. We also have Viva la Revolution, BLR which was more attuned to concerns of everyday life than the other groups. And the VLR was uh, actually involved in women and gay rights movement. And these are definitely positive reforms. They definitely help bring on a lot of um, major changes in France. But five years after 68, the Maoists seemingly are spent for us. And part of it you could well, attributes to the Munich killings of 72 and their own turn to violence. And Wallen believes that revolution was a lost cause in France by the 70s, and he also believes that reform was a more effective route to change. We get the revulsion of the left against the Cultural Revolution, Solzhenitsyn's exposure of the Gulag, the new philosophers, here we go, uh, the champion of Eastern period dissidents, humanitarian intervention, you know, attacking Yugoslavia, Iraq, Libya, you know, great imperialist mass murder, um, yet, 
Wolin still believes Mao's influence can be seen in current struggles for immigrant rights and the social minimum wage. Uh, Wolin doesn't offer much criticism of these later turns of Maoists because he seems he doesn't really think that humanitarian intervention is really nothing more than well-crafted shield for imperialism. And service by, to the French state by ex-radicals is much is pretty similar to what the French communists were doing and the Maoists criticized them for earlier. And he seems Wolin seems to celebrate the decline of the left in the aftermath of the May revolts. And he also seems to promote the uh, single-issue campaigns that the Maoists embrace. Yeah, these single-issue campaigns are can be useful, and they're definitely one path the Maoists took. And they can lead to some worthwhile reforms. Yet, you know, we got the 35-hour week in France. and But look at the latest protests in France over the last few months, even. Austerity definitely makes these so-called reforms taste bitter now. Now, although Wolin does an admirable job of explaining French Maoism, and he's got some omissions and distortions to be sure, but this book is still valuable. And granted, he definitely celebrates some of the achievements of Mao the French Maoists, but considering the French crisis and the austerity they're imposing, along with the general crisis and capitalism in general, I'd argue that it shouldn't be the single-issue campaigns of the Maoists we should embrace, but the revolutionary uh, right to rebel that they embraced in 1968. That's what we should be embracing. Anyway, this is Ina in Windy, the Fight Back. Till next time.